Well, I saved my apple from lunch because I thought, wasn't there a story about Newton? <laughs> uh, that, that could be the unfinished business, you know. Um, what? What? Oh, it was William Tell. <laughs> okay. I'm getting my, my apples mixed up. Okay. Um, thank, you, thank you, Terry, uh, for those uh, words. And thank you, for, uh, Christine, uh, for welcoming you back. And I'd like to add to that, uh, too, as the seasons change and we're going into the cold weather when it's really nice to be in the library. Um, warm again. Well, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, today Professor Vicki Green uh, to talk to us. She's a professor of physics uh, and astronomy, or just, no, no, not astronomy, uh, just physics at Vanderbilt, as well as being executive dean in the College of Arts and Science. Vicki received a PhD from Yale in 1992, and she's been with us at Vanderbilt ever since, and we're lucky to have her. Not long ago, I believe, I don't know if this is, hope it's not confidential, she was offered the opportunity by the Obama administration to head up the federal agency overseeing all nuclear physics research in the US. And when she heard about the opportunity to talk to you, <laughs> she turned them down. Uh, now, Vicky's a high energy physicist, which, uh, Actually, she does, which means she does an awful lot of work. Um, but in particular, she works in high energy physics. Uh, working with the, the Large Hadron Collider, which is an enormous particle accelerator in Geneva, in Switzerland, which is located, as I understand it, hundreds of feet underground, and it's many, many miles long. This accelerator crashes subatomic particles into each other at incredibly high speeds, recreating conditions similar to those around when the universe was coming into existence. Remember that a long time ago? Um, <laughs> she's at the cutting edge of nuclear physics research, and she writes papers with honestly indecipherable titles. I, you know, I looked at her Vita, and I thought I'd, I'd read up a few of them out to you, and I thought, there's no point. Um, <laughs> they don't make any sense uh, to me. Um, but she's very good at explaining um, the significance of her work to people who aren't experts. Uh, and this is important because this large hadron collider promises to solve one of the great scientific mysteries, which is what mass is, what it is, what mass is, and where it comes from. And perhaps in the course of her talk, she could also share with us how, I'm told, a bird with a baguette shut down the uh, world's most powerful particle accelerator not long ago. Please welcome uh, Vicki Green, who's going to talk to us about Newton's unfinished business. Well, I wanted to thank all of you for coming here to see a physics lecture. And I wanted to thank David for that rather fantastic introduction. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm here to talk to you about the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. It's one of the largest and most complex scientific endeavors of all time. I think it's safe to say that. So I want to give you a sense of why thousands of scientists and engineers from numerous countries would spend decades and fortunes to build and operate it. But first, I want to talk about something that you most likely think of as simple, which is mass. Okay. Uh, so um, mass has a long and illustrious history. Uh, Johannes Kepler was the first scientist to introduce the concept of gravitational mass, and he used that to describe the influence of the sun on the motion of the planets. Galileo found the gravitational mass of Jupiter by observing the motion of its moons. And then Isaac Newton, in his Principia, um, introduced the concept of inertia in his Laws of Motion in 1687. And mass is essentially a measure of the inertia of a body. 
So Newton stated his law, uh, second law, I'm not going to go through all the laws, but he wrote it as, a change in motion is proportional to the motive force impressed and takes place along the straight line in which that force is impressed. Well, it's wonderful, but it's not easy to work with in that form. So uh, if you actually wanted to see what's happening with the, the second law, um, I do have to subject you to a couple of equations. It won't hurt. Um, so uh, if you look at the first equation, uh, it says the same thing that Newton said in words. Um, force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Uh, and you can see directly if the acceleration stays the same, if the mass gets bigger, the force has to get bigger. And um, if you want an elephant to get up to the same speed as the raisin, then you have to push much harder on the elephant. And this formalizes that bit of um, common sense. Uh, Newton also formalized the universal law of gravitation, which described the gravitational field of a planet as proportional to the mass of a planet. And this is uh, the second equation here is Newton's law of universal gravitation, also from 1687. And, uh, it just, it has mass in there as well, the mass of the body feeling the gravitational force and the mass of the body exerting the gravitational force divided by the square of the distance between the two. So you probably um, were familiar with this. Uh, now, notice that mass is used in two very different contexts here. One is the, the inertial mass in the first equation, and the other one is the gravitational mass in the second equation. Now, there's no reason to assume that they would be the same. They're uh, relating to two very different things. But as far as we can tell by experiment, they are, in fact, the same. So the concept of mass has proven to be incredibly persistent. Okay? Um, you can see how long it's been around. And uh, we've had several scientific revolutions since then, the most notable perhaps being the introduction of the theory of relativity in the 1920s. And throughout that revolution, the idea of mass persisted and appears throughout Einstein's equations. And then um, quantum mechanics, uh, another great revolution um, in the 20s. And mass persists throughout the equations, the quantum mechanical equations. So the concept of mass has just stayed around. And yet, um, Despite this uh, persistence of mass, we don't, uh, I was talking to David on the way over here and he said, you know, I, don't, I realized I don't really know what mass is. I mean, we all kind of have an idea about what it is. It sort of, you know, tells you if you have more mass, you weigh more. Um, and we have a sense that heavier things then are harder to push, so there must be something there. But uh, we don't have a theory that's confirmed that tells us what mass is and why objects have the mass that they do. And this is one of the mysteries of fundamental physics that the Large Hadron Collider at CERN Laboratory in Geneva was built to unravel. So um, before I talk about this, I want to say something about what we do know. Um, I I want to say there are different ways of approaching learning what matter is, what things are, how the universe works. And one way uh, to think about what stuff is made of is to think about just taking it apart, pulling it into pieces, pulling it into smaller and smaller pieces. This is what I think of as the, uh, maybe the child's way of doing things, largely because this was my approach when I was a child and it my mother didn't really like me pulling everything apart, but I did it anyway. Um, and so, and mostly I couldn't put the things back together, so it, it, most of it didn't end well. So smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so here, um, if you look back in time, uh, and this, is, this picture uh, shows the beginning of the universe, which we believe was very hot, dense, and it's been expanding and cooling ever since. And up here at the top, at the end of this timeline, is just where we are right now with things like galaxies and uh, so our solar system and so forth. 
But at the higher and higher temperatures as you go back and back in time, um, these large accumulations of mass couldn't exist. These large accumulations of matter could not exist. And so you get things broken up into their smaller and smaller con constituents parts. And so it's these constituent parts I'm going to talk about. But know that when I talk about these things, in some sense, I'm going back in time and showing what things were like at these very high temperatures that existed early in the universe. So, um, I want to talk about something called the standard model. And um, this really covers all of our understanding of the subatomic world. It fits into one big theory called the standard model. The name is a bit of an anticlimax, I know, but it's there and it's stuck, so this is what we call it. But it, it's, it's a theory. And um, I learned, if you look at the top, um, I, didn't, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the top row, you can see we start with matter, and the next step down is atoms, the next step down is the nucleus and the electron in the atom, and then there's the nucleus that's made up of protons and neutrons, and then the quarks. So my mother learned about the atom maybe with the nucleus and the electron, and I learned about the neutrons and protons in the nucleus, and my daughter is learning about the quarks. So our understanding of the very fundamental nature of matter is uh, increasing ev with every generation. So the way this standard model works is there's, we believe, four forces. There's the strong force, which is really the nuclear force. Um, there's electromagnetic force. There's a weak nuclear force, and it's called the weak force because it's weak. Um, compared to the strong nuclear force that is. And then there's gravity. And we believe that these are the only possible interactions. And each one of these is carried by a different particle. In the case of electromagnetic uh, force, it's carried by particles of light, for example. And in the case of the strong force, it's carried by particles called gluons, which are kind of whimsically named because they stick together um, particles. Uh, and then we have... Uh, two categories of particles. One is the leptons, which are electrons, which you know about. And then you may or may not know about uh, what's called an electron neutrino, which is a very elusive particle that can pass through you know, the entire Earth without interacting. And then we have the quarks, which are the pieces of the, atomic, of the neutrons and protons in the nucleus. And each one of those consists of three quarks. And so uh, they're stuck together with the gluons. So all of matter um, that us, the universe, um, seems to be made up of primarily of this top row of matter. And it's only when you go to higher energies like in cosmic rays or in an accelerator that you start making these more, these uh, families of particles. They have the same structure. There's a, there's a, one thing that's like an electron, there's something that's a different neutrino, there are heavier quarks, and we believe that there are three sets of these particles, and that's all that, that we've seen. So, what we, so we can describe how the bigger particles, like protons and neutrons, as well as exotic particles, they're all known combinations of the quarks, stuck together with the gluons, and how particles like electrons interact. It's a very complete theory, and despite decades of experiment and desperate trying by particle physicists, um, there hasn't been found anything that can't, at least in principle, be explained by the standard model. However, uh, back to our question of mass, the theory does not explain why the particles have the masses that they do. There are additional theories for that, and the most widely accepted is called the Higgs mechanism. So this theory suggests that all particles had no mass just after the Big Bang. And as the universe cooled and the temperatures fell below a certain critical value, uh, there is an invisible force field that became commonly known as the Higgs field, and it was formed together with particles called the Higgs boson. And uh, this field prevails throughout the universe, and any particle that interacts with it 
is given a mass via the Higgs boson, which is this particle. Uh, the more they interact with the field, the heavier they become, whereas particles that never interact are left with no mass at all. Um, so to put this into um, the analogy most commonly used, because that's a little, maybe a little obscure of an idea, there's a, an analogy that is the party analogy. So you have a party, it's the top left picture, all these scientists at a party, and you imagine, okay, they're just milling around, okay, and then um, a famous scientist comes in. So everybody wants to talk to him, wants to be with him, wants to hang out with him, and so they begin to just cluster around, and the more they cluster around, the harder it is for this person to make his way through the crowd. So it becomes harder and harder to move this person. Um, you could replace this idea of the person coming in with uh, the idea of just spreading a rumor that the person is coming and people might start to cluster together on their own and talk about is the person coming and I want to see him and what did he do the last time he published and all of that. And you could imagine that the cluster could form on its own without even the person being there. So it's this forming and clustering together um, out of this sea of uh, people at the party is an analog to the Higgs mechanism. And just to show you, um, picture of, the, there it really is a Higgs behind Higgs, this is Peter Higgs, and um, a lot of people actually came um, up with pieces of this idea, but this one, his name stuck with it, so that's why his picture is here. Okay, so far the Higgs has not been seen, so it's a nice idea, but science is based on evidence, and we would need the evidence for this Higgs in order for this theory to be uh, confirmed. So there's been decades of looking. Uh, one problem is that we don't really have a very good uh, prediction of the mass of the Higgs, so we don't know exactly where to look, although earlier experiments at the te Tevatron in the US have ruled out a range of lower masses. So we want to do this experiment. We want to look for the Higgs. So to do this, you need a source to produce unusual particles. And the way you can un produce unusual particles is, um, the way you produce unusual particles, uh, you need an accelerator and some way to observe them and identify them, which is a detector. So this, it's really separated into two parts, things you need to build and operate. The accelerator that produces the particles, the detector that detects them. Uh, as a reminder, the thing that we are looking for, they're very small. The particles that make up forces and matter are so small that if the nucleus of an atom were enlarged to the size of a tennis ball, about like this, then the period at the end of a sentence would be as big as the, the uh, Earth's orbit around the sun. So they're very, very small. Uh, they're so in infinitesimally small that obviously they can't be seen with a microscope, they can't be seen with the naked eye, so you have to uh, be able to build some other experimental approach besides that. And you can see here uh, different experimental approaches if you want to probe matter at various scales, uh, like a camera would be fine for taking a picture of a human. Um, I'm not so good for taking a picture of a DNA molecule. You'd need a microscope for that. And we need particle beams to probe the atom. So this brings me to the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, one of the main goals is to either find the Higgs or demonstrate that it does not exist. And I'll tell you that there's at least as many scientists who are hoping that we don't find it because that's really interesting as opposed to hoping we find it, which is expected. Um, so the large in Large Hadron Collider is because it is 17 miles around, so it's very big. And a hadron, it accelerates anything made of quarks, in this case generally protons. 
And Collider, um, I'm going to slip in one more equation, uh, although I'm not going to project it, which is E equals MC squared. I know you've all heard that one. And what it means is that you can interchange energy and mass. So uh, we can use the energy in the collision between two protons to produce more particles. We spin them up to um, a very high energy in this accelerator, which we do using magnets to bend them around and radio frequencies to spin them up. They're counter-rotating, and we let the beams cross, and there's a collision, and all the energy from all those times around the ring is going into this head-on collision with another proton going just as fast in this direction. So all of that energy can, be, be pr uh, can go into producing matter uh, just by E equals mc squared. So um, the higher the energy of the accelerator, the more massive a particle we can make. So we need a very high energy accelerator to push beyond the limits set by early e experiments. So um, facts about the LHC. Let's see if I have a. No. There, it wouldn't be PowerPoint if you weren't sending your slides in circles. Um, <laughs> Okay, so here's some fun facts about the LHC. Okay, it accelerates protons to um, a, the speed of about 0 0.9999991 times the speed of light, which we believe is the universal speed limit. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but maybe a little easier way to imagine this is that a proton could travel around the ring 11,000 times per second. 17 miles around, 11,000 times per second. It's very fast. Uh, the ring is uh, up to, it's underground. Um, it's up to 574 feet deep underground. The superconducting magnets are cooled to minus 271.3 degrees C. We need magnets so powerful that they all have to be superconducting. And uh, so um, it actually forms the, the cooling system forms the world's largest res refrigerator by a factor of eight. By contrast, uh, we also have pretty much the hottest thing in the, in, on Earth, which is that the, inside the collision, the temperature will be 100,000 times hotter than the center of the sun. Now, this is a very tiny volume, so it's not like you see a fireball, but in that tiny volume, it is extremely hot. The vacuum inside the tubes is equivalent to that of interplanetary space. Uh, now, it co on a more practical um, realm, it costs nine billion U.S. dollars for the accelerator and about 1.1 billion for the detectors. So it was not cheap. Uh, data production is expected to reach 15 petabytes a year. A petabyte is a quadrillion bytes, or one with 15 zeros behind it. So, lots of data flow. So, we have the accelerator, we have the collisions, we have to do something to actually uh, form a camera for the event since we can't really use a camera. So, heavier particles produced in the collision will fast computers to process the signals and store the data. And we put this whole thing where the beams collide. So I'm going to show you one experiment. It's the one, and I'm doing it again. OK. I, I wanted to mention one thing about why you build a detector in a certain way. So um, lots of part, what we have here is a little close-up of the collision. It's a cartoon. So you have a beam going this way and the other beam going that way. They interact where those two arrows meet. And lots of stuff gets sprayed along the direction of the beam. As you can imagine, there's stuff going forward, there's stuff going backwards. But um, the beam energy can make a heavy particle, and if that happens to go um, perpendicular to the beam, it's much quieter. So you want to build a detector that kind of circles the collision region like this so that you can measure things that are perpendicular to the beam. 
you don't want all that spray because then it's very hard to pick out the good stuff from the boring stuff. Um, so then generally the big mass decays to the little mass, little masses. Here is a cartoon of the um, detector and I'll show you a, a better one in a minute. But uh, I wanted you to note down at the bottom um, that little white thing, that's the person. So this is very, very large. And you can think of this as being built like layers of an onion and each layer of the onion measures a different type of energy or a different attribute of the particle. Um, and then there's going to be a big magnet that curves around just to, uh, it, because watching how things curve in a magnetic field is another way of identifying the particle. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you can see this from where you are, but all of these pieces that um, are labeled here, uh, the, I don't know what that was, uh, these different pieces that are labeled here um, are also labeled with the countries that built them. This thing wasn't built all in one place. It would not be possible to do that. So different countries build pieces of it, and then it all has to come together. Now here is a slice. This is a little more manageable thing. It's a slice of the experiment, and it shows uh, some simulations of particles going through. Uh, so that uh, it, there's um, a tracker that makes particle tracks, and then there's something called an electromagnetic calorimeter, which measures electromagnetic energy, uh, a hadron calorimeter, which measures um, Elec which measures hadrons. Hadrons are the strongly interacting particles, so it would be like a proton, anything that interacts with the strong force, uh, just like the electromagnetic calorimeter is things that interact with the electromagnetic force. And then once you get out past that through the magnet, uh, you would be looking for something called a muon. Um, and this is, muon is sort of like a heavy electron. It was on the standard model picture, but it goes through uh, vast, it can go through vast amounts of steel, so it doesn't interact very readily. So if you want to measure it, you have to put up a bunch of steel and then detectors in between in order to actually be able to see it. So you can see how the particles curve, the charged particles curve because of the magnetic field. You can see how the electron, or the muon goes all the way through. You can see how um, the electron stops in the electromagnetic calorimeter and the charged hadrons, which are the green lines, stop in the hadronic calorimeter. So you measure energy, uh, you can construct momentum, and with these things you can identify the particle and reconstruct its mass. So different par uh, types of particles just will interact differently and that's how we identify them and then we can put those pieces together to figure out what, um, what happened. So uh, fun facts for CMS, I just wanted to show you a picture so you can see that it's a, a real thing full of wires and electronics and um, it, great complexity and you could ask me a little bit about how it got down in that hole in the first place. Um, and, but you can see it, so it took 20 years to design and build. There are about 4,400 active people, including about uh, 1,700 physicists, 845 doctoral students, and 690 undergraduate students. Uh, the people come from 172 institutions in 40 different countries. It weighs as much as 465 Boeing 737s put together, and uh, as I said, it's 100 meters below ground. So now um, I just wanted to show you some results. Uh, we're still processing the data from the run that just finished, the 2011 run. I can't show you the current state of the Higgs measurement, but I can show you some candidate events. These are actual events that have the decay characteristics that we would expect. So you can see what this looks like. Uh, okay, so this shows, um, it's got the detector stripped away and it just shows the tracks and the hits in the detector. So this is actual data that you're looking at. 
And this is an event that decayed to two Z bosons, and then one Z decayed to two muons, and one Z decayed to two electrons. And this could conceivably, one of the decay modes for a Higgs is to decay to two Zs. So this, this is a p potential one. But you can see the electron tracks in red, and then these muon tracks, which are barely visible um, in the top. So this is, this is what uh, the data look like. Okay, and here's another uh, candidate event with something went to two Zs and the Zs went to four muons. You can see these have these straight tracks in them um, because they just plow right through anything. And you can, you can reconstruct the mass of whatever that thing is that decayed to two Zs that decayed to two muons. You can work your way up the chain. And uh, fortunately, you don't have to look at all of these events by hand or we'd never get done. Um, people used to have to do that when there were bubble chambers and they would have to look at each picture by hand. But we can do this electronically and just plot the mass distribution for the particles and look and see what we see. So that's... Um, I'm just going to leave you with that little bit of uh, tantalizing data. Um, <laughs> I've told you about the fundamental building blocks of matter and how to hunt for the Higgs. Um, I hope you'll be watching out for exciting, res exciting results from the LHC. Uh, I wanted to thank you so much for coming, and I wanted to thank David for inviting me. Thank you so much. Now, I, I do have one or two questions, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and my, I think my first question is this. I, I recently uh, had a problem with my car. And <laughs> no, 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 it's not what you think. Um, and, I, and I actually lifted up the hood and started looking inside. And, and someone came by and said, you know, I never, I never lift up the hood of my car. I just let someone else fix it. I just drive. Uh, and I'm thinking, I mean, this is the most extraordinary story about what's going on at levels of magnification and so on that we haven't really can't even imagine. Can we? Can most of us just keep driving uh, <laughs> without, without knowing any, anything about this? I mean, uh, you know, for, this is really operating at such a sort of micro, nano, small level. Um, does it matter to most of us, or can we just keep driving along until? Something goes wrong. <laughs> well, not if your car's broken. <laughs> anyway, um, that, no, that's a really good question. Um, as far as the physics goes, I think this is a sheer discovery for at least the foreseeable future. It's always very hard to predict um, exactly what's going to come out of a certain piece of physics, but at these very high energies, um, seeing that something, you know, that in practical terms, we're going to harness the Higgs. It doesn't seem likely. Uh, but what, where it does really impact you is in the things that we have to develop in order to actually do the experiments. Uh, for instance, um, back in the early days of CERN, um, even back before my time, they had, to, uh, they had something called Bicycle Online, where they had to, in order to get the data, um, from where they were taken to where they were analyzed, somebody would put these big tapes in a bicycle basket and ride them over there. And this means of communicating was not uh, totally practical. Uh, in working on better ways to communicate with each other, uh, somebody, a uh, scientist at, the, at CERN, uh, developed uh, the World Wide Web, okay? So <laughs> that, you know, that's I something that... that was Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> that's another question. <laughs> and so, so something like that, uh, accelerators are um, used, uh, you know, developing accelerators that were developed for, for particle physics are used now most, um, I think I actually wrote this down, but 
um, most of the um, accelerators, like over half the particle, the world's particle accelerators, and I hadn't known this, half the par world's particle accelerators are used in medicine at this point. So that was something else that was developed for these experiments. And the whole uh, question of how you handle and store uh, petabytes of data is another thing where we're really pushing the limit of technology for managing data. And this is something that you're likely to see some uh, effects of. So it's those kinds of things. Okay, yeah, I got a, a follow up then, which, because a lot of what, you know, I, I was fascinated by your story of like atoms and electrons, that was my era, and then your, your era, and then your daughters, and, and finally quarks, it sounds like a TV family, but. Um, uh, <laughs> Or and German then, cheese. Or German cheese, and they get and things are getting smaller and smaller, and I'm wondering. I mean, this is this is kind of a philosophical question, but how uh, much is what we know about the universe dependent on our methods of detecting things? And what I'm thinking is, I mean, imagine this were to just keep going, and act in you know, reality that that every time you get a new level of detection, there's more stuff. I mean, is that possible? You could just keep that there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can't see, can't detect. Can't. And that's just because, you know, like we don't have good enough microscopes. Is it possible? Is it possible? I, I could interpret that in a couple of ways. One way is to think, you know, what if this is something where you peel down and right. you just peel back layer after layer yeah. after layer? Um, it, I, it's conceivable, but I think with the complexity of this accelerator, um, unless something really changed about how we mount these experiments, I can't imagine doing uh, some, you know, doing another one. So I think this way we're not going to peel down further. We actually were building, as you probably know, the superconducting super collider uh, in Texas, and that project got canceled. That it, this one was 17 miles around. That one was 54 miles around. And it would have, well, if that one had been built, this never would have been built. Uh, but, you know, I think it's growing impractical to do more. Um, I guess the, um, I'm trying to think of the other. Well, it may be impractical, but um, philosophers don't really care about the practical. <laughs> they're, they're, they're more interested in, in what we can imagine. Uh, I mean, so I'm just thinking, could there be more, could there be stuff that we just can't see uh, and that could be important? I mean, and could it just keep going down and down forever? Well, I could be philosophical and say, well, if you can't detect it, then how can it have any impact on you? Usually we see that something's, mm -hmm. something's causing an interaction. Even if you don't see it, like for instance, we believe now that the universe is full of this dark energy, uh, we can see the effect. And that's why we think it's there, but nobody knows where it is, what it is, okay? So if you see the effect, then you can go after it. But uh, sort of like, you know, if something never interacts, then it's really hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine what effect it would have. Maybe f f philosophically it might have an effect, but in practical terms, no. Okay, there's one last question which you don't have to answer. Um, this Higgs boson has been called the God particle. Um, what do you have to say to that? <laughs> oh, I think that was a very silly and unfortunate name for it because I can't see any way in which it would be considered the God particle. I think, you know, I think someone just meant to say, oh, this is the, the, the last thing that we need to find, and it's sort of like the ultimate particle. But the, the God particle, I think, um, it, unfortunately it caught on, but I don't think it really meant anything. It's just a particle. So do you think we could have uh, an account of the creation of the cosmos that was exhaustively uh, in physical terms? Just be physics. For me personally, I think it, when it depends on when you want to start that accounting. Because obviously, with something that um, 
you, you see how everything comes to pieces as it gets hotter and hotter. And this, take you, this can take you back to just uh, right after the Big Bang, but I think everything, if there was a before the Big Bang, I mean, there's this singularity that existed before the Big Bang, that would just be um, destroyed in the conflagration. So I don't see how you could go past that. That would be more your neck of the woods. <laughs> Touche. All right. <laughs> well, we're going to open the uh, questioning to the floor. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering when you say they built the flight line, uh, when the flight and the detectors were built, how difficult was it to balance the sensitivity to radiation with the possibility of radiation damage? You know, if you run an experiment, you get some fantastic big explosion. Do they then hand you a repair bill for putting in some repairs about the um, the amount of radiation in these collisions, while the energy is high, um, there's, I mean, you have to consider radiation damage, but it's not as hard a problem in, in these proton-proton collisions as it is in other situations. For instance, uh, the other thing that the Large Hadron Collider does is it collides lead nuclei which is actually what I work on. And uh, that, that is much more of a taxing environment. But um, I think it's, the, the hard thing is to build the inner tracker. As you can imagine, the innermost detector is the challenge. And uh, this one is silicon, which is very radiation damage susceptible. Uh, there's research being done into diamond detectors, which would be much more radiation hard. So are you asking, is, is this dangerous? <laughs> is, is that your question in terms of radiation? No, no, I'm doing a PhD in radiation detection. And so this is okay. I, I'm not, I can't say without breaking the air. Thank you. Is it dangerous? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the question? <laughs> Is that an official question? Um, I don't believe it's dangerous. If I did, I wouldn't work on it. There was a lot of uh, discussion. I'll plow right into this. There was a lot of discussion before it turned on about is it dangerous? Is it, in fact, going to cause a black hole? Or are the strange matter going to um, eat the Earth? And the, you know, there was a study done, actually there's been a similar study done before every experiment I've ever done, and the, the thing that you have to understand is while this accelerator produces a lot of these interactions, these energies are nothing new to the universe. So there's cosmic rays at these energies uh, routinely and higher energies. So if this were going to be a danger, it would, these interactions take place, like say as an example, on the moon all the time. So something would have happened to the moon by now if, if this type of collision were dangerous, because nature produces these. It's just easier for us to do the experiments, not waiting for nature to produce them, but to actually produce them ourselves. Thank you. The gentleman in the middle. Yeah, I, I have a two-part question. Uh, do we think that the uh, dark matter was exposed to the Higgs field, number one? And if it was, will the experiment you're doing with the Large Hadron Collider is going to do to see the Higgs boson, wouldn't we then be able to use that same knowledge to see dark matter? Um, it, everything was exposed, if this theory is correct, then everything was exposed to the Higgs field. and. Um, I'm not a real dark matter person, but I do know that there are um, teams of people working on trying to uh, tease out dark matter effects from these um, interactions. So I don't know if that specific mechanism is what they're using to do that. Uh, 
Oh, yes. Is this, this one back there? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, this isn't directly related to your work here, but or, or it might be. There have been reports lately of a partial shooting of Peter Light. I'd like to comment on that and whether or not it would be relevant or have an impact on what you do here. Uh, so what this is about is uh, about a month ago, a paper was published that what was happening is these uh, neutrinos that I mentioned, see now you know what they are, uh, they travel very far and they don't interact much and there's a, and they, they'll change as they fly along from one type of neutrino to another. And so there was an experiment that was using neutrinos from the LHC to look for this oscillation back and forth. And it's, uh, I think, 760 kilometers apart going through uh, just Earth to get to this detector. So they weren't, in, in the process of doing this experiment, they weren't looking at this, you know, looking, they weren't designed to look for this, but they were looking at the velocity of these particles as part of calibration. And they noted that um, they were seeing it, apparently, these things going faster than the speed of light. They were traveling from CERN to Grand Sasso, the mine where the detector is, in uh, less time than it would take light, which is not something that we believe uh, to be possible. Um, although the theorists are now scrambling, making up ways that it is now possible for this to be the case. You know, they're, they're trying to explain it in case it is, in case it holds up. Um, <laughs> that's what they do. Um, so there, it's a very difficult measurement. They didn't, it's not like they came out and said, ha, we found something faster than light. They tried to do what you, a good scientist would do in that case, which is, this doesn't make sense. I'm going to try to um, find out where I went wrong. But after a year of studying this and trying, they didn't find that they did anything wrong. So they put it out there for other people to try to replicate. And it's possible that it will hold up, but also, you know, it's, it's measuring, uh, the, me the measurement that they're doing should be a good measurement if you just look at the difficulty of the measurement versus the results. So it could be right, but it's got to be confirmed. I mean, something that revolutionary would have to be confirmed, and I can guarantee you that people are scrambling to confirm it. I, uh, I wanted to, I have a question related to that one, but I wanted to make a comment just, um, some philosophers have said that the outer and inner limits of the universe will only be understood when the observer and the observed are a unit. I mean, that's just to answer your original question. But my question is, which I don't understand relativity completely, but if you have two particles going at 0.9 the speed of light, relative to each other, are they going faster than the speed of light? No. No. But they're both going at just under the speed of light towards each other, so relative to each other, you know, I, 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 I said I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the answer is no. Um, when, if, if you analyze that in the context of the special theory of relativity, uh, you'll, you'll find that that doesn't, it doesn't, the velocities don't add that way. You can't just add velocities together in the way that we're used to doing it. You know, if I'm going 55 miles an hour and I throw a ball out the window, it's going 55 miles an hour plus whatever I threw it at. It, it just doesn't work that way. So you have to use different equations to add the velocities together. There's a lady down here. Back in 1964, a while back, I did a press release on a research paper that a professor at the University of Tennessee had done involving the pions and neutrons uh, and the accelerator. And here we are almost 50 years later. And I guess what's going through, I'm not a scientist, I'm a PR person, and I look at what's the practical, what's the message, what's, what's the point. 
here we are 50 years later. Are we looking, are we still continuing to look for the smallest particle? What, what, what's the point of where we're going? We're really not um, trying to find necessarily the smallest particle. What we're trying to do is to construct a theory that just explains the physical universe. And as I said in my talk, there's different ways you can go about doing this, and I'm not saying this is the only way, um, but this is a way which is a very natural way, which is to just try to break things up into building blocks and into you know how you stick those blocks together. So it's really trying to understand the Tinker Toy set of the universe. Any more? Yes, uh, two more questions. You uh, mentioned uh, colliders being used in medical research. What area of medicine and what's the objective of the work? Um, accelerators, not colliders. Uh, there's um, a lot of um, proton therapy for cancers is one example. Um, I think that that's the main one that comes to mind. <laughs> Just so you understand, the last thing I truly understood what you said was the bicycle and the bicycle basket in the form of communication. That I understood completely. I've just it's just coincidence, but in the last three days I've heard things on NPR about physics and quantum physics and how the hippie sage science for quantum physics and I was wondering if it's National Physics Week or the month. <laughs> no, it's, it's National Vicki Green uh, uh, Day today. It, it was all a run up to this talk. <laughs> well, the, 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 we have one more question there? Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, whenever you run an experiment, typically how long does it take from uh, from calibrating the, the instrument all the way through to the close of the experiment. It seems like it's a, it's a very complicated uh, design, and so to focus two particle beams to hit each other after spinning around so many times, 17 miles, and you, you gave the, the high speeds, and they're all focused on using magnets, and it seems like it would be a very difficult thing to calibrate. And, I was just curious about you know one experiment. How long would it take to, to conduct one experiment? Um, I'm not sure if I know exactly what you're asking, so I'll start answering it. And if I'm not answering your question, just interrupt me. Um, to from conception to like finishing building the thing can be ten to twenty years. Like the CMS was twenty years to build. Uh, and then you have to get everything going, which making it work is really, really hard, and you know, getting it all to work together. Uh, you always make mistakes, so you have to fix the mistakes. Um, you know, all, that whole process can take you know, a year or more. And then um, taking the data usually goes in cycles of a year. Oh, um, I, I don't know how long it takes uh, specifically to calibrate the machine. It's something that you do constantly. You know, you, you will run calibration runs all the time, and you're always monitoring. Um, you have to look at a lot of the data as it comes out to make sure. I mean, these are not physics kind of plots, but you see how the detector is performing, and you have to make sure things are not getting off. So it's sort of a continuous process. And then, so you run for a year and then you shut down for uh, several months and then you can go in and recalibrate. But one thing is when it's running, you can't get at it, right? It's in there, it's in this hole. 
uh, there's this beam and because you're one of four experiments, if you have a problem, it has to be a really serious problem before you tell all of these other experiments that you want to shut down and check out your detector. So um, it's, that's a multi, it's a multi-faceted problem. Well, before I thank our speaker, I, I just want to uh, ask you a question. You know we're kind of rethinking uh, this series and trying to figure out ways of making it uh, a whole lot less expensive. And I was just wondering is if, if when you came to your lunch, we gave you a paper bag, and inside the paper bag is a lot of dark matter, <laughs> <laughs> but, but nothing else. Um, in other words, if we took the lunch out of thinking out of the lunchbox, how many of, of you would be just less, a little bit less inclined to turn up um, for your intellectual food on a Wednesday lunchtime? You could be honest. So we, we I think I would have to go out of the room for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good. Yes. Okay. Well, that, that's quite encouraging. Um, um, but uh, I'm just, I'll just collect that data and process it in, in the next few days. But today I'd like to, to thank uh, Professor Green.